Welcome to the third and final session of this RCEP webinar, Applications of Carbon Dioxide Measurements for Climate-Related Studies. My name is Erica Podest, and I am an RCEP instructor and a scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where I study terrestrial ecosystems with satellite data. Today's session will focus on the use of OCO3 data over a large urban area. It will start with a theoretical portion and will be followed by a demonstration with Jupyter Notebook on how to access and analyze OCO3 data for urban area studies. As a reminder, this webinar series has three sessions. The first one was a recap of the OCO2 and OCO3 missions and the characteristics and limitations of the data. The second session was on the impact of drought on CO2, and today's session is on uh, CO2 measurements over a large urban area using data from OCO3. There is a homework associated with this training, and it will be due on August 14th, so we have a new due date. And the certificate will be given to those that attended all the live sessions and complete the homework by the due date. Today, we have three guest instructors, Dr. Abhichek Chatterjee from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He's the project scientist for the OCO3 mission and the deputy project scientist for the OCO2 mission. He'll be presenting the first part of the session, discussing the characteristics and uses of CO2 data from OCO3 over urban areas. It will then be followed by a demonstration that was developed by David Moroni and Karen Ewan, both from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Karen is the OCO2, OCO3 applications lead, and David is the OCO2, OCO3 RCET team developer. The demo will be presented by Karen Ewan, and it will show participants how to access and map OCO3 data for an urban area using Jupyter Notebook. Here are the objectives of this session. By the end, participants will be able to recognize the importance of observing CO2 over metropolitan areas, identify important aspects of space-based CO2 measurements over urban areas, access, subset, download, and analyze multi-year OCO3 SAM data using a Jupyter Notebook, and visualize this data, this SAM data, over urban areas to be able to do interpretive and comparative analysis. How to ask questions? Please write your questions in the questions box, and that box is located, if you see the three little points on the bottom right, you click on there, uh, you'll have a pop-up win window, and one of them is questions. So please write your questions there, and we will answer uh, your questions at the end of the webinar. And you can write your questions as we go. So we'll try to get to all of the questions during the Q&A session. However, if we cannot, we will answer the questions on a Google Doc, and we will be posting this Google Doc onto the website in a couple of days. Now we will start with the first part of the session, which will be presented, as mentioned, by Dr. Chatterjee. This is the second RCEP training that Dr. Chatterjee has supported as guest instructor. He was guest instructor for the first RCEP CO2 training back in 2022. So it's really great to have him back. Welcome, Dr. Chatterjee. The floor is yours. Thanks, Erica. Well, welcome, everyone, to this part three of this training. As Erica mentioned earlier, and as you have seen through most of this training session, we'll be learning a lot about carbon dioxide emissions and the data that's collected from Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2 and Observ Orbiting Carbon Observatory 3. Today's part will focus primarily on the data that the Orbiting Carbon Observatory 3 mission, which flies on the International Space Station, the data that OCO3 is collecting over large urban areas or megacities. We will talk a little bit about why this data is important, why we need to study urban emissions, 
and then move into the type of measurements that OCO3 provides over urban areas and how those measurements can be used to understand emissions. And then finally, what we will see is that these measurements by themselves provide an indicator of the net emissions that are happening, but what as a community and what the world really wants to know is the different sectors that are contributing to this urban emissions. And so we will see how we can bring in information from other satellites that are flying or other sensors that are operational that provide information about other trace gases or other greenhouse gases like methane, carbon monoxide, or nitrogen dioxide, how we can use those information together in conjunction with the CO2 observations from OCO3 to get an understanding of the sectoral emissions. So why are we interested in knowing the emissions from urban areas? Well, I'm sure that most of you live in one or the other urban areas that have been shown in this map. Uh, this map shows all the different pockets of areas that are classified as megacities or urban areas based on their population characteristics. And more than 50% of the global population reside in this, in one of these pockets that are shown here. But in reality, this only covers 2% of the world's surface. However, it's these pockets that are responsible for more than 60% of fossil fuel CO2 emissions. So that's like a huge amount that's contributed to the total fossil fuel CO2 emissions just from these urban areas alone. Now, it also turns out that there is going to be a growth of urban areas. So the map or the pockets that I showed in the previous map, those are not simply static, but in fact, those areas will continue to expand and grow. This is a paper, these was a, the figure shown here is taken from a paper by Professor Karen Sito at Yale University. And back in 2012, uh, there were a group of papers that actually looked at forecast of the probabilities of how urban areas will expand. Now, there was a lot of the expansion that will happen will mostly happen in areas, uh, for example, just north of Middle East and in India and China, as well as in several other areas, even within the United States, as well as like in South America. Now, what's kind of interesting is that even though some of these areas will have expansion going on, really there weren't many areas where there would be any kind of decline that we would see. So in general, more and more of the population is expected to move out from rural areas and move into urban areas. What that means is that there is going to be more and more emissions that we will see. Previously, I mentioned the number that more than 60% of fossil fuel CO2 emissions will be contributed by urban areas. But likely, by the time we get to 2050, or around that time, we will likely see that more of the contribution of fossil fuel CO2 emissions are coming from urban areas. I also strongly recommend you all to check out a couple of these resources on urbanization, that's from the National Geographic, and then also on the environmental impacts of urban growth, which is again a web page that, uh, that is maintained by Professor Sato's team at Yale University. So given that there was going to be an increase in both the number of urban areas, as well as the fossil fuel emissions that will happen from the urban areas, it is not surprising that there are many international entities that are now starting to take a lot and uh, more and more action or interested in taking more and uh, initiating specific type of activities that will help curb or somehow reduce the am amount of emissions that are happening from urban areas. So the most recent or uh, at the very highest international level, the most recent action that has been initiated is, was at the COP28 last year, where several nations came together to form this coalition for high ambition multi-level partnerships or CHAMP for climate action. 
And this is the first time that at the UNFCCC level, different nations have got together to look at their specific cities or subnational regions and come up with a climate action plan. Similarly, there is a group called C40 Cities. This is a global network of mayors of the world's leading cities that are all united in action to confront the climate crisis. And the name C40 here comes from the fact that all of these cities that are part of these coalition, all of them have population of above 100,000 people. And what they have realized is that for these cities, if they are able to reduce their emissions by 40%, then collectively they can meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. Uh, if you go into the C40 cities webpage, uh, and if you just type for C40 cities, you will see a map of all the different, uh, a global map showing all the different cities that are part of this coalition. I strongly recommend you to check it out because one of the urban areas or cities that you're living in, likely they are part of this group and that will help you follow sort of the actions that the, your particular city is taking. Now, in addition to these, there are also other sub-local or sub-national entities, for example, the ICLEI, which is a coalition of local governments that are coming together to address sustainability within large cities, as well as entities like the World Bank Group that are actually providing financial and funding support to different cities in order to make sure that they are working towards reducing emissions, uh, mitigating them, and addressing the climate problem or the climate challenge as a whole. Now, all of these different entities, they are obviously interested in reducing urban greenhouse gas emissions, but at the same time, they're interested in monitoring or tracking them. And what they require from all of the work that we do in terms of taking measurements and estimating emissions are information that's policy driven and actionable. This is also reflected a little bit within uh, the United States, where recently the United States federal government came up with a national strategy to advance an integrated greenhouse gas measurement, monitoring and information system. And there is this working document that was released last year but one of the interesting pieces of this document is a very strong focus on reducing urban greenhouse gas emissions, maintaining a strong monitoring network around urban areas, and then making sure that different cities or different urban areas are taking actions to mitigate them. This is actually a conceptual illustration. This is for the Los Angeles basin, but just shows a conceptual illustration of how this urban scale prototype would look like where you have satellites, for example, like OCO2 or OCO3 flying above taking measurements. You have aircraft monitoring, as well as you have like these uh, small towers that you can see, which are a little bit hazy in the background, but you have these tower sensors that are also uh, measuring the CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions. So, Kind of needless to say that there is a, a lot of interest in maintaining a, a strong network and then monitoring the greenhouse gas emissions. Now, the reason why you need a diverse portfolio of observing systems is because the source of carbon emission within cities can happen from various sectors. It's just not, it's not necessarily just one single source. If you think about just the urban area or city that you live in, you know that there is power consumption. There are power plants and industries that generate emissions. You have the transportation sector, like your cars and planes and ships and trains that generate emissions. You have the residential and the household where, you know, where we turn on the light and we turn on electricity. And a lot of that is coming from CO2, em a lot of the um, uh, directly results in CO2 emissions. So I point all of you to this paper that was written by Professor John Lynn from University of Utah that came out in 2018 that actually does a great synopsis or a summary of all the different types of uh, emissions, all the different types of sectors within a large urban area or a large city and how they all contribute to CO2 emissions. What this paper also does, and we'll come back to this a little bit later, 
is that it actually links the CO2 emissions that happen, the sectors that are responsible to air quality and socioeconomic activity. It really makes for a really fascinating reading that specifically within the urban domain, how issues like air quality and pollution, those are actually strongly go hand in hand with CO2 emissions, CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions. Now, one of the other things that you might come across as you start looking into the literature for urban emissions are what is called as scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Now, what this is, is that the emissions that happen within an urban domain, they are simply getting broken up into the specific sector or region or uh, particular uh, organization or individual that's generating them. Scope one typically means that these are direct emissions that are happening within a city boundary and that we can kind of observe from the atmosphere. Scope two and scope three are more indirect emissions. So, for example, scope two refers to, let's say, electricity, steam, or something else that's being purchased by the city that's coming from outside, but then is contributing to the emissions within the city. Whereas scope three is more indirect, where this can be different goods and services, uh, waste that is generated in different operations, employees that are commuting from a different area to another area. Um, all of those kind of contribute to scope three. The reason that I kind of point this out here is that when we typically talk about emission monitoring from satellites or the data that the satellites are see, they are looking at the entire atmosphere over an urban domain. So they are looking at all of the emissions together. And typically it's kind of most easily attributable to the scope one. It's very hard to actually pick out scope two and scope three, which since all of that information kind of gets mixed together. In order to get scope two and scope three, you actually need to use more something like bottom-up emission inventories or activity-based uh, data, which can then help identify how much of the emissions that you are currently seeing, how much of that is originally brought indirectly from the domain outside your particular city or urban area that you are interested in. So the traditional way in which urban emissions have been characterized is what is known as bottom-up estimation. A bottom-up estimation typically means that there are many different ways in which bottom-up estimation of urban emissions can happen. But the most common one there is where we rely on activity data. So for example, how much fuel is being consumed, what's the traffic count looks like during the morning and during the evening, and statistics from different industries we take stock of those activity data, multiply that by emission factors that are sort of known or established within the literature or reported, and generate what are called as emission informations. Um, the other way of doing this is instead of relying just on activity data, we can use some kind of uh, uh, some kind of a process-based model or some kind of inventory information as well and generate this bottom-up estimation. There are a variety of different ways that uh, this can be done. And I have pointed out to a very nice report that was written by the US National Academic Sciences Board called Greenhouse Gas Emission Information for Decision Making. The hyperlink is provided here. So if you go to the hyperlink and look, you will find a much more detailed description of how this bottom-up estimation is done, what are the different types of methods that are used, and how we get at this emission information. Now, the big challenge with the bottom-up estimation is that sometimes, depending upon how the activity data is reported or how the inventory is being generated, there can be a huge discrepancy between different bottom-up estimates. I have shown here three examples. This is from a paper that came out in a Journal of Geophysical Research Atmospheres in 2020. This paper looked at three different state-of-the-art bottom-up estimation estimates from uh, three different inventories or three different data sets. 
um, FFDAS, ODIAC, and EDGAR. And these are just comparison maps that are shown over the Middle East. And while when you just like stare at them quickly, it sort of looks like, well, they roughly get maybe sort of the same uh, overall, they can get like the same type of patterns. But if you actually start looking at the differences, you can see that there can be some large differences depending upon which region you are looking at. And in some cases, for example, you can have like a lot more granularity, uh, for example, in EDGAR uh, or ODIAC relative to like FFDAS. So there is difference both in not just the spatial distribution of where the emissions are happening, but also in the magnitude of the emissions. And this can happen due to a variety of reasons, because again, each of these inventories or uh, this activity based information, they are being generated using different data sets. Uh, they are using different information. Uh, there can be slight different in the emission factors. All of these result in some of these uh, differences that we are seeing in this maps. If you actually now scale this up and look at like different urban areas. So the previous map was showing for an entire region, but let's say if we actually scale up and look at specific urban areas, this is from a paper that came out in 2023 by uh, Arne et al in environmental research letters. And in this case, what the authors did was look at emission estimates for a variety of cities that are part of the C40 group. So remember the C40 coalition we talked about earlier. Here they looked at like, I think around 90 or 96 cities within that C40 group. Oh, sorry, they looked at 78 of the 96 C40 cities were analyzed in this study. Um, you can see like map of all the different cities, just showing the emission estimates and sort of the domain um, that have been defined uh, for each of those cities. And then on the right hand side in this figure, what they did was each of these cities as part of the C40 group, they have their own way of reporting the emission data. So that's part of this GPC inventory. Um, and then the the authors compared this GPC inventory with two other fossil fuel emission estimates, one based on EDGAR, which is again a state of the art uh, global one, and then ODIAC. And what is shown here then is the differences uh, between EDGAR and GPC or between ODIAC and GPC. And quite interestingly, we see that if you look at all of the C40 cities together, we certainly see that there is like a huge discrepancy between what the cities report versus what our inventory estimates are providing. And then if you start breaking up the cities by which particular region they come from, whether they are in Africa or whether they are in Latin America or North America, then you kind of also see some big differences. So for example, if you look at all of the African cities together, then the self-reported GPC style inventory estimates differ a lot from what Edgar or Odiac is telling you. But over North America, for example, those differences are kind of much closer. And one of the main uh, sort of uh, highlights from this paper was that this differences between different emission, invest uh, emission estimates these are highly regional in nature, and you can really see the difference between the uh, Annex 1s, like cities that are part of the Annex 1 versus like non-Annex 1 countries. So now that we have seen that there is this large difference in bottom-up emission estimates, which again, is a, I will stress that even though there are large differences and very important way in which emission estimates are generated and highly needed, especially given, remember that bottom-up emission estimates are the only way that we can get scope two and scope three emission estimates. It's extremely important, but clearly there are large differences between them. So this brings us to the question that can space-based emission estimates, such as the one that we derive from OCO3, can they be used to keep up, give us a handle or give us a check on the emission estimates that we derive from bottom-up inventories? So this is now where we introduce the Orbiting Carbon Observatory 3 and the specific information that it takes over urban areas and megacities. 
This is what is done through a particular mode of observation known as the snapshot area mapping or SAM. Now on the part one of your training, you did hear a little bit about OCO2 and OCO3, but just to give you all a quick recap, OCO2 launched in July 2014. It's a free flyer. That means it flies 700 kilometer above the Earth's orbit. It measures both column average CO2 and solar induced chlorophyll fluorescence. OCO3 was built from the spare of OCO2 instrument and launched five years later in 2019. It is on the International Space Station. It makes the same measurements as OCO2 and even actually operates on the same modes, Nader, Glint, and Target, that you might recall uh, from um, what you learned in part one. But then it has got this unique fourth mode of observations, which is known as a snapshot area mapping mode. And what that is, is that as the International Space Station is flying over, let's say this is like an urban area or like a target area. In this case, this is actually a power plant. Then as the space station flies over, then it can quickly take snapshots of the images around that particular area. Or what this allows us is that within a very small localized area within like, let's say 80 kilometer by 80 kilometer, it takes almost two minutes for the space station to fly over. But within those two minutes, we can take this very dense concentrated data uh, around that region. This very nicely complements the global Nader and Glint measurements that we take and which we can use to do a lot of the other sciences. For example, in part two, you learned a lot about the natural fluxes that we estimate and understanding its relation to climate. But the SAM mode, or uh, snapshot area mapping or SAM mode, as we will refer to during the rest of this talk, the SAM mode is really, really helpful then for constraining urban emissions or emissions around a CO2 hotspot, like around power plants, et cetera. Where do we take these SAM measurements? Well, we take these SAM measurements across the entire globe. The space station can only see between 52 north to 52 south. So that's why this map is sort of truncated. But all of these dots that you see on the map, this is where we have taken uh, observation in the SAM mode. Now, the observations in the SAM mode are taken not only around large CO2 emission hotspots, so those are what we call as fossil SAMs, or those are the ones that are shown in the blue dots. But then there are other sort of areas where there is a lot of interest in the scientific community in taking this high density data. And those can range, for example, around volcanoes that are shown in the red dots, as well as around some edicovariance tower sites where we want to better understand the linkages between carbon and water cycle. So those are like some of the green and the purple dots are where we take um, those sites. But all the total SAMs that we have taken, uh, like so in the four years that OCO3 operation, we have taken around 16,000 SAMs. Out of that, 60% of the SAMs are taken over this fossil fuel areas information about where these SAMs are taken and how many SAMs have been taken over a particular location. All of that is available on a public web page. So again, I strongly recommend you to go and check out this OCO3 SAM web page that is hyperlinked here. And you will be able to zoom in on the map. You will be able to pick out your own city or see if we have taken any SAMs there. And in fact, if you see that there are no SAMs that have been taken over the place that you live in or over an area that you are interested in, there's also a feature on that web page where you can go and request a SAM. And we can certainly take that into account when we are planning the next set of operations. So how do these SAMs look like when we take them over urban areas? This is just two examples, one for Los Angeles and one for Mexico City. So the Los Angeles map is shown on the left, the Mexico City map is shown on the right. The Los Angeles map, you can clearly see that we have put in some uh, particular markers there for those of you who might be familiar with Los Angeles. Wherever you see this high intensity yellow uh, color, that's where we see an enhancement in CO2 concentrations. And 
Quite surprisingly, or not so surprisingly, it turns out that these high CO2 concentrations end up along big transportation routes or trucking routes that connect the port of Los Angeles, which is in Long Beach, to downtown LA, where a lot of the goods and services sectors are. So this lines up along two of the big interstate routes through which uh, trucks move. Then similarly for Mexico City, again, if I play this, uh, we again see there is like a large CO2 concentration or enhancement that happens around the downtown region. Whereas if we move away from the downtown to sort of like the background, then there is like less CO2 concentration. There have been, these are just two examples uh, for the purposes of this talk, but there are similar OCO3 observations that have been made over other urban areas. And there is like a whole uh, suite of studies that have now been published. I have referenced several of them here, but this is not a complete list. So I do strongly recommend you to check these studies out, but then hopefully these should lead you to other studies that have used uh, OCO3 SAM data. And there have been emission estimates now that have been derived for Los Angeles, for Mexico City, uh, for a couple of cities in China, for Paris, uh, Boston, et cetera. So what OCO3 sees or the observations that we take, those are CO2 concentrations. Now, those observations do carry information about emissions and processes, but how do we go from that observations to that emissions? This actually happens through a rather complicated process called inverse modeling. You learned a little bit about inverse modeling in part two of this training, but to sort of reframe that inverse modeling or that methodology within the urban context. In this case, what we need to do is that we have our observations that some observations that we have taken over an urban area. Those are the observations taken here. We start with some kind of information about what the background provides or what the background CO2 concentration looks like. We define what the boundary conditions are. So let's say around this Los Angeles area, we kind of define a boundary as shown in the square box. We have some prior information about the emissions that are happening from various sectors, whether that's from power plants or from the aviation sector or transportation, et cetera. We then use some kind of an atmospheric transport model that simulates the way the winds are blowing around and how much mixing is happening along the entire atmosphere, and then come up with simulated observations that we have here. And then we start minimizing the differences between the simulated observations and the actual observations that are taken. So this entire process is known as atmospheric inverse modeling. It's a, a little bit of a complicated process, certainly, but there are many, many papers that have been written on this topic to on how you can generate this urban emission estimates. And in fact, all of the papers that I referenced in the previous page, almost all of them have used one or some form of these a particular methodology. So again, one of the reasons why I strongly recommend you to check those out. Now, while this atmospheric inverse modeling, one would think that you can use these observations and directly get at what the emissions are, one thing to keep in mind is that the atmosphere is an imperfect communication channel. So that means that there is some loss of information that happens through mixing. And in, in this sense, when you do this inverse modeling, when you apply this methodology, there are certain uncertainties or certain errors that kind of can creep into your estimates. So which is why when you generate a top-down based emission estimate, you always provide not just what the mean estimate is of what the emissions are, but then some error bound around it to capture all of the different uncertainties, whether that's coming from mixing or how you define your background or errors in your observations, etc. However, a key point for this type of regional uh, urban inverse modeling is like how you define the background. And so I want to spend a little bit of time in giving you a flavor of how this background is defined. What background in this case means is we are trying to refer to 
to a particular area or region of atmospheric XCO2 that is not contaminated by emissions from or within the domain of your interest or your study domain. How you define that background? Again, there are multiple definitions that have been used within different studies and a few of those different examples are kind of provided here. You can do a geographic de uh, definition. So, for example, if we go back to this particular uh, example of looking at Los Angeles, you can, let's say, define a point that's way outside of what the urban domain is and use that as like what your background uh, CO2 concentration looks like and use that to subtract off from the actual CO2 observations. Or you can do something a little bit more complicated and sophisticated like what's called as a trajectory endpoint method or an overpass specific method where you actually modeled the background based on information that you have and use that to calculate the enhancements. Uh, for the exercise later, we are going to use a very simple method in which we are going to just assume a very random background value far away from your urban domain of 410 ppm and we'll do that just for visualization purposes. But you should be aware that, yeah, there are more sophisticated methods on how the background can and should be calculated. So the background certainly contributes as one big way in which uncertainties creep into your urban emission estimates. But if you kind of try to compare the two between the top down and the bottom up approach, this table provides a list of the advantages and disadvantages of each. The top-down approach, um, as you know, within the inverse modeling methodology, you can define different grid resolutions. You can define a very fine grid resolution from a kilometer to something coarser. And it can certainly, you will have errors due to wind, metrology, and determining the background condition. You will also need to account some way for the urban biosphere signal because remember within your urban areas or cities you do have trees growing you do have plants and those contribute to actually uh, taking up some of the co2 uh, in that domain so that needs to be accounted for but the main advantage here is that it considers real atmospheric observations and it provides a very important sanity check on the bottom-up emission estimates now, the bottom-up approach, on the other hand, the big disadvantages are, or the big uncertainties there, is that it relies on self-reported economic energy activity data. So a lot of it is self-reporting. You can miss specific sectors, or maybe there is a particular sector in which there is a severe under-reporting of the emission estimates. And typically, these actually lag by multiple years because there is a large amount of input data that needs to all come together. There are large different sectors, different companies, different industries need to provide all of the data in time to be able to come up with this bottom-up emission estimates. However, the good thing is that these can still be generated at high spatial and temporal resolution because you can almost go industry by industry. So it's not you're not even looking at a grid cell, but you are looking almost at like point by point. And um, as I have mentioned previously, is that this provides an estimate of scope one and two and three emission estimates can all be tracked in this bottom up approach. So again, you can see that between the top down and the bottom up approach, there are advantages and disadvantages of both, which is why there is actually value in in pursuing both and in fact all of the strategy documents that i mentioned previously like the u.s national strategy or even like some of the international coalitions the strategy that they adopt they typically want to adopt both of them so they do want top-down emission estimates but they also want to make sure that they do keep on getting the bottom-up emission estimates as well because there is value in having both of those emission estimates available now what we will look at is how we can pair OCO3 CO2 observations with measurements of co-emitted species. And this again comes back to the point that observations of atmospheric CO2, they actually provide a great constraint on the net emissions, but 
what we are really interested in is what are the sectors within an urban area or a domain that are contributing to those emissions. And in order to get at those particular sectors, it turns out that sometimes tracking observations of carbon monoxide or nitrogen dioxide, those actually provide a great indicator of what different sectors are contributing. But the first question is, why and how does that happen? And this is a very nice pictorial representation, again, from this National Academy's report that I had mentioned earlier, that shows that within an particular urban domain, there are multiple different uh, processes that are at play. It's a very dynamic system. So we not only have our well-mixed greenhouse gases, uh, like CO2, methane, and N2O, but you can also have a lot of the short-lived gases and aerosols like carbon monoxide, the VOCs, et cetera, all of which kind of, kind of interplay and dynamically link with each other within an urban domain. And it turns out that, if, for example, we are tracking some of these co-emitted species like nitrogen dioxide or methane or CO, then, these can help with both getting more robust total emission estimates as well as with the sectoral attribution. How or, how or why would this happen? So let's look at a couple of examples. First, nitric oxide, for example, is co-emitted with CO2 during the combustion of fossil fuels. It rapidly reacts with ozone to form nitrogen dioxide. But then the NO2 vertical column densities, we can observe those from space and ones that are released from fossil fuel combustion, they actually have a pretty high concentration and they are far above what the background values should be by several orders of magnitude. So that means if you want to understand particular sectors that are particular sectors like power plants or any other sector where fossil fuel combustion is happening, then if you use the NO2 tracer along with CO2, we can get a pretty good handle on that particular sector. Similarly, carbon monoxide is another tracer for combustion. It has a longer lifetime than NO2, and it can help pinpoint hotspots where there is poor combustion effic uh, efficiency, because CO is sort of, if the combustion is not, if there's no total combustion happening, then CO will be released alongside CO2. And so this can help inform subsidy emission and pollution control efforts. And I provided a couple of references here uh, that have used specifically either NO2 or used at carbon monoxide to do the sectoral attribution. Uh, I hope that you are able to check those out and see how the information from those species kind of have been used together. The other point that I forgot to mention and which is important is that Along with the fact that CO2 is a great tracer for net emissions, we are, always have to keep in mind that for CO2, as you have seen in both the previous parts, part one and part two of the training, there is a large background signal. Like CO2 has been present for several, several years. And right now, the, there is like pretty high concentration of CO2 already in the atmosphere. It also has a large variation due to the natural fluxes. So like due to the natural plants and if the city is by the coast, then by changes in the ocean. So typically CO2 enhancements that you will have due to urban emissions, their variability can often be swamped by changes that are happening within the natural fluxes. And in order for us to be able to look at like the CO2 enhancements, and then tie it back to the sectors, it actually is really helpful if you are able to use information from this co-emitted species as well. So we are now going to look at a couple of examples that really highlight this point of how CO2 and NO2 together, or CO2 and CO together, how those can be used. So this is one example that shows coincident data that has been taken from OCO3 as well as from the Korean Geostationary Environmental Monitoring Spectrometer, GEMS. This is a geostationary platform that is actually looking at this particular region that is shown in the blue bounding box here. 
so primarily focused on uh, Korea and Southeast Asia and part of the Indian subcontinent. And I've shown two examples on uh, for two different days, one over Seoul in South Korea, the city of Seoul in South Korea, and another over the city of Vindhyachal in India, where there are a large cluster of power plants. The maps here or the top figures here show the CO2 data from OCO3, and the bottom two figures show the NO2 data from the GEMS instrument. And what you can see is that, for example, for Seoul, we see that where we have these large CO2 concentrations, that actually lines up very well with where we also have the large NO2, uh, large NO2 enhancements as well. These are actually both enhancements that are shown. So this helps pinpoint like all where the not only where the hotspots within the city are, but likely sort of the presence of power plants and other heavy industries that are contributing to this high CO2 and NO2 signal. Similarly, for this particular case in India, that's shown on the right, we know there are large, several large power plants. I think there are like seven or eight large power plants that are present around this particular lake. And that's where you have this high concentration in NO2, and we kind of see a corresponding large CO2 enhancement as well. Now, the CO2, NO2, and then along with the carbon monoxide data, this can actually be utilized together as well to get a better understanding of not just the sectors, but also of the emission patterns between different cities, and sort of like then do some kind of an understanding of whether the cities fall within the Annex 1, like developed nations versus non-developing nation. This is a really great study by Park et al. that came out in the Remote Sensing of Environment Journal, where they looked at multiple cities across the globe, over uh, 30 cities were looked at, and they used data for CO2 from in this case, it was actually used from OCO2 instrument, not necessarily OCO3, but the same type of observations that we have been talking about. And then NO2 and CO from the European Tropomi instrument. And what they did was that they actually looked at ratios of CO2, of CO and CO2, and ratios of NO2 and CO2, and then sort of broke those up by looking at the GDP for different cities. What they found was really, really interesting is that for some of the cities that are present between, uh, that are present in developed nations, so for example, in Los Angeles, Tokyo, et cetera, where you have high GDP, those typically have low CO versus CO2 values, or even sometimes low NO2 versus CO2 values. Whereas cities that have like a lower GDP, especially cities, for example, in India and then in the Middle East, et cetera, they have lower GDP, but they can have higher CO versus CO2. So that means in those cases, like the combustion efficiency is not good. And more often than not, they are producing higher CO emissions or higher NO2 emissions, which kind of likely contributes to more air pollution. So they had like this really fascinating um, highlight in their study saying that developing cities have higher incline of emission ratio per GDP than the developed cities. This study is kind of fascinating and I know or I'm aware there are like several other studies that are in preparation right now that are planning to look at like longer time series of the satellite data and trying to assess whether these statistics that were derived in this paper, whether they are robust, whether there is some kind of trend in them over time, or as even, in fact, as cities start reducing greenhouse gas emissions and put in some practices to try and curb greenhouse gas emissions, then whether these trends uh, will evolve or change or not. And then, Finally, I kind of wanted to provide this very new example that um, we have available right now from the International Space Station. So on the International Space Station, we have OCO3 instrument flying, but there is recently another sensor that has been installed there by NASA, which is called EMIT. 
Now, the EMIT mission wasn't originally designed to target greenhouse gases, but it has turned out that because of the particular wavelength that it is looking at or observing at, we can actually pick out some very large point sources of CO2 and methane. And this is an example over uh, the city of New Delhi in India, which is kind of situated in the star here. We have information from three different sensors now all together. The background that you see in, the, in this violet and yellowish color, this is from the European Tropomi sensor providing information about NO2 observations. And we can kind of see this like patch of NO2 enhancements that are primarily due to where the industries are located in this particular region. We similarly have the OCO3 SAMs over this particular area. And again, you see the high yellowish enhancements here, which is from the CO2 concentrations, um, which again, because of the wind and sort of different factors, they don't exactly overlie with what the industrial emissions are. But it seems kind of again concentrated towards this north east sector. But then what's interesting is that with the emit sensor, we are able to pick up now these two methane plumes, and these are coming from two different landfills that actually are present within just outside the city boundary. And these two landfills typically generate a lot of methane emissions, and those methane plumes are now observed from this emit sensor. So this is like a fascinating uh, kind of a snapshot of the type of monitoring information that we are likely to get in the future. Uh, EMIT has been operational for only a little bit over than a year, so there is not like a huge length of data record. But over the next few years, as we start getting more and more of the satellite data, we expect these cases to become more frequent where we can use information three different species, CO2, NO2, and CH4, and we can not only get an estimate of what the total urban area emission estimates are, but then exactly pinpoint the estimates that are happening from landfills, that are happening from industries, or that are happening in general from the transportation sector and other sectors. So this is really a fascinating direction that the space-based community and this entire community is sort of gradually evolving towards. So with that, I would like to kind of summarize uh, what we have talked about as uh, part of in, in this part three. Um, again, just to remind everyone that urban areas, there is certainly a huge growth that's happening in urban areas. There is going to be a further expansion of urban areas as we get into the 2050s. And now there is a rapidly increasing demand from a range of users whether that's within the public sector or the private sector or different agencies for trusted information about greenhouse gas emissions. The OCO3 SAM observations that we learned a little bit about, those have certainly advanced our scientific understanding of urban CO2 emissions. They have helped us better understand the particular top-down approaches that we need to use, the inversion methodologies that we need to use to address or generate emission estimates that are robust and that have got like well characterized uncertainties. But more importantly, or more crucially, what they have demonstrated is that space based CO2 measurements, those have the information content and the ability to quantify emission changes that are happening across urban areas. When that information is used in conjunction with co emitted species such as NO2 and CO we can actually get at sectoral attribution. So for example, we saw uh, some examples of information coming from like power plants or from other sectors, heavy industries, from landfills, et cetera. Um, there is now a lot of interest in using all of this information together along with information about GDP and population density to track socioeconomic characteristics within different global cities and look at the contribution across different cities. And finally, this information and the emission estimates that, that we can generate using this space-based data, this also provides a check on bottom-up emission estimates, which can ultimately help boost transparency in carbon accounting and assist with overall decision-making process. 
So with that, thank you very much. I would like to end this lecture here and then now turn it over to sort of the hands-on exercises uh, that we are about to dive into. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee, for that great presentation. Now we will move on to the demonstration portion of this session. The demo was put together by David Moroni and Karen Yuen. However, Karen will be delivering it. This is David's first time supporting an RSET training as guest instructor and Karen's second time. She was guest instructor for the CO2 training back in 2022. So welcome to David and a big thank you to Karen. It's great to have you back. The floor is yours. Now we will go over to the demonstration portion and we will open up Jupyter Notebook. I'm working on a Mac system today and I've opened up a terminal and typed in Jupyter Notebook. For those on a PC system, you would open up a command prompt and do the same thing. Go into my folder. Oopsie. And make sure I opened up uh, and open up this one also. You should see my screens for the notebook. Once you have opened Jupyter Notebook, you would open up the notebook that's entitled RSET, OCO3 Data Map and Plots, using OpenDAP and XCO2 Variability in Select Urban Areas. And that's what you'll see here on your screen. Um, the data set used in this notebook is the OCO3 Level 2 Full Physics files that are archived at the Goddard DAC or just disk. Um, the link for this is in the notebook, and it is in the NetCDF format. Um, the notebook accesses data from the DACs um, from the DAC using OpenDAP or Open Source Project for a network data access protocol, and uh, this allows you, the user, to only have to run this particular notebook to retrieve, subset, and download data, and also do the mapping from one notebook. It simplifies uh, even further the typical uh, client server model when using OpenDAP. And acknowledge here, I would like to thank my co-authors. Um, first, Sigar Limbu, who's our former student and employee at JPL, uh, Charles Thompson and Dave, David Moroni at JPL, as well as our collaborator, Dr. Abhishek Chatterjee, who is also the project scientist for OCO3. I'd like to point out that this notebook is only meant for initial training and demonstration of the utility of these data sets in support of OCO2, OCO3 RSET training. This notebook is designed to function as is for the scope of the training exercise as code dependencies and data sources periodically become deprecated or updated. The users of these notebooks bear the responsibility to maintain and or repurpose these notebooks and associated dependencies in a workable state beyond the source of this initial training. Uh, this notebook was produced to support the RSET OCO2, OCO3 training. And for full details, please go to the RSET site for this training. Okay, so we are going to start. Um, we'll start in the beginning by importing the libraries you need to set up the environment. Please don't be alarmed. I know, as you can see all these, there's a lot. However, most of these would be familiar and they are grouped by uh, specific purposes. And you'll see that um, I put in lots of notes in different areas if you wanted to understand uh, what we're doing, you know, the pre-processing, um, visualization and plotting, uh, uh, retrieving later, um, data from the link which for the, for the OpenDAP, all of that um, is explained here. So I'm gonna run this cell. Next, you would be asked to log in um, to go into this notebook. Since this is a continuation of Activity 2 and you already have your store.netrc file, you should be all good here and you would run the cell. 
or you'd be prompted for login if you have not. You run, and now at this point, we are going to run um, the cells that will help you choose the areas that you want to look at. And I'd like to point out, there are notes here. If you get lost, that tells you how you should put in uh, the values. But when you run the cell, there, you're requesting input for your year, month, and version for the files. You will be prompted to enter the year first. Please use four numbers for this. Um, for example, just don't put 24, do 20, uh, 2024. And for the month, um, for the singular digit months, January to September, start with a zero, followed by the number. And for the double digit months, you would use the double digits. And then enter 10 for the current version for the data available. So I'll show you here, like I said, you put in, um, but I'm going to use 2021 as the year I want to look at. I want to look at the month of June, so I would do 06 here. And then I'll type in 10 here for the version. And you can see um, that came back very quickly. And now we will go to um, uh, the opened app to access the files that we want to look at. And let me run the cell. And from here, it says it's pulling the main URL. And now we're inside the session. And you will see that, in fact, we have pulled 338 files. And we'll be ready to start um, averaging the files, the, the values of the files together. But before I go there, um, I want to point out that this particular line here, line eight, this last code here, it is uh, an area where you can choose to look at it by month. You see the plus month here. If you do remove this part, you would only pull the data for one year. And for right now, for the sake of time, I'm going to show you um, the time it takes to download one month of data. And then, but I'll show you the results of what it looks like if we have one year of data. So we're going to prepare for plotting by looking through these cycle periods. And you'll see that from the 338 files that we had before, we are down to 30 files. And now we are going to retrieve from OpenDAP the files and all the variables that we are looking for. The variables that we call are um, the XCO2, the vertices for the lo longitude, the latitude, based by sounding ID, and the quality flag. And now we will let this run. All right, we have finished downloading our files, and we know this, for folks who didn't know, um, this will become a number again. It was on a star for a long time. Once it becomes a number, you know, you know, you know. And uh, we were able to do this in three minutes and 38 seconds for the files. And we will do the next step. And um, just so you know, uh, when we uh, pull the files, uh, from OpenDAP, um, you have to be aware that depending on your computer and your internet speed of where you are, the time for download will vary. So that's just something to bear in mind. That is why we're doing the example for one month of data first, and I'll show you what it looks like for one year of data uh, in a short while. And um, now that we have pulled files and variables from OpenDAB and subsetted them by XCO2, the vertices for the data footprints, and also the quality flag, um, we will start the pre-processing. And what the, it does is that the pre-processing, since we got the vertices from the corner points of the data, this will create the polygons that would represent the footprints in our plot for the map. And um, this will include, this will require additional processing time 
and but not as long as the the file download so as you can see from here we create a frame for the variables that we have and also we are filtering the data by the quality flag and making sure it's set to zero and now we will let this run for a couple minutes and you see you have the star here when it becomes a number you are done with your uh, pre-processing all right so we've had a couple minutes pass and you can see we have pre-processed the data and now we're going to get ready to plot now i will run the cell where we would use base map and begin our plotting And in this particular cell, you do have the option of being able to choose your minimum and maximum that you want to look at just to, depending on what you're interested in, in studying. Uh, for today, we have it set for a minimum at 405 ppm and 425 ppm for the maximum. And this will also prompt you for the city name because we're using base map and let's run this. And once now we can locate the region that we want, I'm going to use Los Angeles. And there you go. Here is your map of the OCO3 data for June 2020, 2021 in Los Angeles. And what we can also do then is plot these values as a scatter plot. And you run this. And we're going to do this for the input for the month. Let that run for a few seconds. And there you go. Here's your plot that shows you all the values for that time period for what we have from OCO3. What you can also do is look at options of looking at other cities that may be of interest. To do that, you simply go back to this cell again, line 14 here run it and you can input another location and I'm going to use Chicago. We'll let that run. And here you go. Here's what OCO3 captured for Chicago, the month of June, 2021. Now, I'd like to uh, let you know that uh, even though we have the option of inputting other cities, not every city will have coverage because SOCIO3 is on the International Space Station and its precessing orbit will only allow latitudes less than plus or minus 52 degrees. So um, you have to consider that when picking the cities that you want to look at. We have this option of being able to input different cities because it's um, it's a uh, an easy way for you to look at what's available and reference the snapshot area maps that are available on the OCO3 website and produced by the OCO3 science team. I'm going to do one more example and come back here again, rerun this out, and I'm going to run um, Paris. So you see you have all the data here for Paris for the month of June 2021 for the OCO3 data. And 
same way we can plot these values on the scatter plot. Oh, sorry. Boom. And there you go. And these are all the values that we have for that month. I am going to go back and redo Los Angeles for the moment so I can give you the example of what it looks like for one year's worth of data in Los Angeles. I'm doing this because um, from home, uh, working with all the files, uh, the downloaded files took 37 minutes and the pre-processing took another um, almost 25 minutes. And so for the sake of time, I'm doing these examples by month here. So here you go. This is what it looks like for Los Angeles for the month of June in 2021. And let me show you what it looks like when it's one year's worth of data here. What's valuable when you look at one year's worth of data aside this plot, uh, I'm sorry, aside this plotted map is really the values that you would get if you ran the second uh, cell that shows the input for the year. And you can see all the values that are plotted that would be needed or that you would be interested in. I'd like to show you. Um, I'm going to go back here for a second. If you recall the line that I had. Line eight right here. I'm going to do a comparison. I'm going to toggle back and forth between the two. So for line eight for the one year, I simply remove the plus month from this line. Here we have the plus month for the one month. And we remove it for the one year. So you have that option for your for what you want to do. And you can check yourself on this because for as you can see, once we cycle, we actually have 338 files we're running through versus the 30 for the one month that we're doing. So it takes considerably more time. It's worth it for what you want to look at, but I wanted to point that out. Um, everything else is the same, but it gives you the option to adjust for what you want and need. This is your one year map. This is your one month map. Thank you for your time today, and this concludes the uh, Activity 3 demonstration for this RSET training. Thank you, Karen, for that great demonstration. And uh, just to remind participants that we will be posting the recording and you can follow the demo along at your own pace. So next, I will provide a summary of this whole training. So a summary of the different concepts that you learned throughout this whole training. OCO2 has a 10 year record with a temporal resolution of 16 days. It flies, overflies the equator at 1.30 PM local time. OCO3 on the other hand has a five year acquisition record the sensor is on the International Space Station, and the coverage is limited to plus or minus 52 degrees latitude. Its observations cover all hours of the day. Both sensors make acquisitions in the Nader, Glint, and Target modes. OCO3 also makes acquisitions in the SAM mode. The XCO2 data from these missions is the column average volume mixing ratio of CO2 in the atmosphere. The data between OCO2 and OCO3 are consistent over time and are complementary. And it's recommended that you use the level 2 light XCO2 data, and these data have been filtered and corrected for bias. 
and they're openly available through the NASA Data Archive Center known as Guest Disk. Surface carbon fluxes are related to the biosphere and oceans. The global average atmospheric CO2 concentration is the integration of all surface carbon fluxes. The temporal change of local and regional CO2 concentrations is related to surface carbon fluxes and lateral transport or background values. Surface carbon fluxes are linked to atmospheric concentration by means of atmospheric transport models. And the process to calculate carbon fluxes from atmospheric CO2 concentrations is called atmospheric CO2 flux inversion. Now, related to the SAM acquisitions, they're useful to quantify changes in emissions occurring in urban areas. And together with co-emitted species, such as NO2 or CO, they can aid in sectorial attribution. They have the potential to monitor the socioeconomic regional characteristics of glo global urban emissions. And these data help increase transparency in carbon accounting and aid in the decision-making process. Homework and certificates. There is one homework associated with this training. It's, you can access it on the web page for this training. And answers must be submitted via Google Forms. There is a new date. It is now August 14th, 2024. So we've pushed it. We've made a, a later due date now. The certificate of completion will be given to all of those participants that attended the live the three live webinars and that complete the homework assignment by the deadline. You will receive a certificate via email approximately two months after today. And here's the contact information for all of the invited instructors. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to anyone here. And we've come to the end of this session and this webinar series. I would like to thank Dr. Abichak for the great presentation, as well as Karen Ewan for, and, and David Moroni for putting that demonstration together and, and for Karen for her delivery. So we've been collecting the questions that you've been writing onto a Google Doc, and we will be sharing that Google Doc on screen with you shortly, and we will begin our Q&A session. Okay, um, uh, as a reminder about the demo, um, you will be able to uh, re-watch the recording. We will be posting it online. And we did share with you how to access the code. It's uh, on the RSET GitHub. And uh, you can, uh, once you access that, you can then download the whole uh, folder onto your computers and run the code directly from your computer. Okay, so online we have uh, Dr. Abhichek Chatterjee, we have Karen Yuan, we have uh, David Moroni, and they will be answering your questions. Uh, so let's just start with the first question. I will read the question and then one of the uh, members of the RSET team will be answering them. Okay, from the top down, are there any global standards for new buildings in terms of CO2 impacts with respect to urban growth? Yeah, so as I have responded there, um, there are now building and construction codes that are being looked at by different countries. These come under the nationally determined contribution from different countries under the Paris Agreement goals. So I've provided the link to a 2022 report for building and construction that was released by the UN Environment Program. It provides a review of different policies that are being implemented, technologies, as well as different countries and what their action plans are. So hopefully that helps answer that question. Thank you. Question number two, which observation mode is ideal for studying urban emissions? 
the snapshot area mapping mode, which we covered in a lot of detail during this webinar, that's the best suited for urban emissions. And there have been many, many publications now that have used that data set. So I provided a link uh, to a list of those publications. Question number three, does CO2 concentration depend on the population density of the geographical area? Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, the short answer is yes, but it turns out that there is like a strong interplay or dependency between uh, the population, the area, and then whether this falls as part of a developing or a developed nation and how the changes are happening. Um, there is recently a nature study uh, or a study that got published in nature that looks at this relationship between different factors and how it contributes to the CO2 emissions. And I've provided a link uh, to that study. Question four, does any country have a legal responsibility to reduce emissions for the public transport sectors? Yeah, this was again a very wonderful question. Um, uh, I think great question. Whoever asked it, Europe in Europe certainly as part of the European Green Deal, there are now actual legislations that have been put in place to look at CO two emissions from different types of vehicles. Initially, this was targeting only heavy duty vehicles, so uh, those that are above sixteen tons. But in recent revisions in the last couple of years, they have now expanded this to cover different types of other vehicles, such as other smaller trucks, buses, coaches. And they have this set amount of targets that they have proposed between now and 2040 about how much emissions they want to reduce. And all countries that are part of the European Union kind of have to sign uh, towards this agreement. There are similar discussions happening in other parts of the world, like in Latin America and in uh, places in Asia. But again, based like if you're just talking about legal responsibility, then I think Europe uh, certainly leads the way in implementing certain policies. Okay, question number five, why is it called a bottom up approach? Yeah, so the term bottom up approach typically refers to the fact that we are collecting information from the ground and then building up. Whereas the atmospheric concentrations and then using those concentrations to infer emission that's called like a top down approach. So the bottom up specifically for when it comes to looking at greenhouse gas emissions. The bottom of approach refers to where there are measurements that are happening on the ground through looking at direct fluxes or you're gathering information about different sectors and uh, also information about different types of industries and power plants and the transportation sector and then aggregating them up to get at CO2 emissions. So think about it as like building from the ground up whereas the atmospheric method is more top-down, so coming from the top. Great. Question number six, is there a plan to be able to access data from Google Earth Engine? Yeah, so I think uh, Google Earth Engine hasn't been included as part of this training, and uh, I believe this question came up previously for parts one and two as well. But yeah, right now, this is not part of the training. Question number seven, at what altitudes are these changes observed? Um, so I wasn't completely sure about which slide this was being asked. Uh, so it was really a little bit hard to follow, but in general, OCO3 installed on the space station, the space station is flying at a height of around 400 to 420 kilometers above the earth. Um, so around like 250 miles and anything that OCO3 is observing is basically observing from that height. Now, this is different from OCO2, which actually has a higher orbit. And so that's flying at like 700 kilometers above the Earth. 
Okay, so I, I sort of interpreted this question slightly differently. Maybe you can touch on um, probably the at what altitudes are the CO2 concentration changes observed? Are they near the surface or higher up? Uh, okay, uh, this would be so near the ground. Uh, this would be near uh, the surface um, because even though OCO2 and OCO3, we are looking at total column observations, because these observations are being made in the near infrared, they are actually able to detect more of the changes that are happening close to the surface. Um, and so in, in that sense, yes, this is more sort of like uh, near surface changes. Great, thank you. The next question, number eight, do you have a similar example for agricultural areas, um, say, or for example, a new football field being constructed? Um, yeah, so again, not without mentioning the slide number here, it was hard to know what the similar example refers to, but assuming we are talking about like the SAM observations or SAM measurements that are made, those SAM observations are typically made over an area of 80 kilometer by 80 kilometer. But within that entire SAM box, you have individual soundings. And those individual soundings are still around four and a half kilometers square. So they are relatively big and certainly much larger than a plot of an agricultural land or even like the size of a football field. So in general, between but then like one of those soundings, it will be incredibly hard to pull out until unless there are some really large changes that are happening because like, you know, for example, there is like a huge fire that's taking place of the agricultural land or a huge disruption, which causes a large change in the CO2 emissions. It would be really hard to pick up changes that are happening um, like at the scale of an agricultural plot or football field. Okay, question number nine. How has the dynamic nature of the atmosphere, particularly in terms of clouds and aerosols, been accounted for in the accuracy of CO2 measurements? So, in addition, compare the accuracy and coverage of different satellite data, such as OCO2, OCO3, and GOSAT. So, I, I would refer um, the person who asked this question to part one of this training, because there we discuss in detail about how the retrievals or the measurements are made, and then all the specific calculation related to clouds and aerosols that we take into account. The CO2 measurements are then, of course, if validated against a network of ground reference measurements. And that's how we know about their accuracy. And I've pointed to a recent paper that compares data from OCO2 and OCO3. Um, that paper also has references to previous work comparing OCO2 and GOSAT. Okay, the next question, what is the viewing angle of the device during shooting? I think that question means what is the viewing angle of the sensor, OCO3 sensor, while it's acquiring observations, those dense observations? Um, so it is, yeah, so I, I'm assuming uh, that's the question. Um, the SAM observations are always taken in nadir mode, so we are looking straight down. Um, so again, going back to part one of the training, there are different ways in which the instrument can operate, including nadir, which is looking straight down, and glint, where we sort of look a little bit at an angle at light reflected off the surface. But the SAM observations are always done in nadir mode, which is why, you know, even if we are looking over an area of 80 kilometer, 80 kilometer, we can scan for only two minutes because that's the time it takes for the space station to fly over and go past the horizon. Right, so I think with the last part, you you answered the next question, how quickly does a satellite or group of satellites see a particular object of interest or area of interest? Yeah, so I mean, again, quickly, I uh, there are two ways of interpreting the word quickly. 
One is that the time that it observes, and maybe we should need to add that, that typically the SAM observations are made within a two minute period. Um, I also interpret this as like the frequency of revisit, and that depends upon the trajectory of the orbits. Now, OCO2, which is a free flyer, that comes back to the same location on the Earth every 16 days. On the other hand, the International Space Station goes around the Earth multiple times a day. And there are, like within, if you look at the four year data record, uh, the data record that we have from OCO3, there are instances where over a particular location, we have observed two or three times in a day. And then at certain periods, there are just like large gaps where we are not able, like even if we flew over a particular location, but because of clouds or aerosols or something else, we weren't able to take any observation for many, many days. Um, so yeah, I guess depending upon, again, what was asked here about the time it takes to observe versus like the overall revisit time. Okay, question number 12. Is it possible to visualize the transport and fate of CO2 at regional scales? Um, I wasn't particularly sure what is meant by fate of CO2. Um, in general, all of the data that we take with those CO3 SAMs and also this dense measurements that we take over urban areas, those are then fed into local or regional inverse modeling. So in part two, for example, what you did was look at like these global inverse modeling where we used models that had like really large resolution and large grids. On the other hand, for almost all of this application over urban areas or over power plants, we actually use a much higher resolution model. So a lot of the modeling that happens is at like scales of 10 kilometers or 15 kilometers. So these are all like high resolution regional models that are used. Okay, question number 13, for the top-down approach, would you say the accuracy of this modeling approach will improve due to improvements in communication technologies? Um, yes, I wasn't sure what was meant by communication technologies. Um, I hope the person who asked this is still online and can clarify. Uh, in general, like I can provide a quick answer or response in terms of how the accuracy of the modeling approaches can improve. And those would primarily be two things. One is that even though we are using a high resolution atmospheric transport model, that means we need to simulate the direction the winds are flowing or sort of what the overall atmospheric transport and dynamics are. And that can be pretty challenging because if you have, let's say an urban area that is sitting right next to a mountain, then you can imagine it's really hard to model how the wind fields are. Um, this is a challenge, not just like for one particular group or one particular set of researchers, but this is a globally challenging problem. And so being able to improve the atmospheric dynamics and atmospheric transport at sort of those high resolution scales, that would certainly have a huge impact on improving the accuracy of the estimates we get. The second way that these estimates can be improved is uh, in one of the slides uh, or in, during the webinar, we showed that there are pieces of information that go in related to the background and how that background is defined, especially for this urban uh, inverse modeling work. That definition of background, that kind of varies depending upon what like a particular researcher or a particular scientific community and it has been shown by studies that depending upon how that background definition varies, that can have an impact on your final inverse modeling estimates. 
So being able to come up with a more robust standardized way of defining the background conditions for different applications, that would certainly again improve the accuracy of these approaches. Okay, question number 14. How can I generate the animation of the observations in urban areas on slide number 20? Uh, yes, that can be done. Uh, that's just scripts written in any software like MATLAB or Python. And essentially, you can use those scripts. Um, the training that Karen and David did, I mean, with some of those scripts, you can kind of like actually start from those scripts and then do some similar animations. Okay, question number 15. Is there a legal definition of the background values for different locations? No, there is no legal definition. Um, it's kind of currently based on best practices adopted by the scientific community. And as mentioned during the webinar, again, it varies between different research groups and um, different um, science experts. All right, the next question, number 16. Greenhouse gas emissions consist of six types of gases. How does SAM help in identifying them separately? The OCO3 SAM observation only provide information about CO2. It does not provide information about any of the other greenhouse gases. And that is why within the scientific and research community, what is typically done is that you then bring in information from other missions like TROPOMI or from the EMIT sensor, and you bring in information about the other greenhouse gases like nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane, et cetera. Um, so hopefully, yeah, that, that kind of helps clarify that confusion. Okay, the next question, number 17. Why is CO2 considered the most important greenhouse gas to report despite the presence of other gases like NO2 and SO2? Yes, so I interpreted this question that there may be some misunderstanding in, in distinguishing between greenhouse gases and air pollutants. NO2 and SO2 are typically considered as air pollutants. They do not absorb infrared radiation. And so by that definition, they are not direct greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases are CO2 and methane. N2O, nitrous oxide, that's a greenhouse gas, uh, water vapor, et cetera. And so I pointed to this link on the EPA page, which provides a very nice definition of all the different greenhouse gases that are there. And then um, sort of like talks about the different sources and sinks for each of them, et cetera. And hopefully that clarifies the question. NO2 and SO2, thinking of them as air pollutants, of course, they are very, very important to study because they have a direct impact on air quality. They also have impact on other, because of the different chemical reactions they can have, they have an impact on other species like ozone formation and uh, a couple of other things, which then can have like these indirect effects on the presence of greenhouse gases. Um, so certainly they are very important to study, but CO2 is sort of the primary longest lived greenhouse gas that is there. Okay, question number 18, how easy would it be to globally reduce or eliminate fluorinated gases as inputs to the dynamic situation? Um, I am not an expert on fluorinated gases. And so I, I'm going to, I'm reluctant to necessarily provide my thoughts. The EPA link that I provided earlier that also discusses uh, the fluorinated gases there. And so it might be worth um, the person who asked this to kind of go and take a look at uh, the description and sort of like what is talked about, about the fluorinated gases there. Great, thank you. And we'll make sure we'll include the link as part of the answer to this question. Um, Okay, question number 19. Is there a reason that developing cities have a higher incline of emission ratio per GDP? 
Yes, and the primary reason is that as developing cities and developing countries, they are trying to make growths in different economic sectors. That means there is more demand for energy use, more growth in industries and transportation sector. Because industries, transportation sectors, and those all are primarily still dependent on fossil fuel emissions, or right now that's like the cheapest way to grow. That's why you end up with like more CO2 emissions. There is a lot of effort and a lot of initiatives that are being taken by the United Nations, the World Bank, and other groups to promote growth that actually takes makes use of non-fossil fuel and uh, non-fossil fuel energy sources so like solar energy and wind energy but again those can be cost prohibitive um, there can be larger costs associated with them which is why if you look at any of the developing cities typically there is like a steep rise in co2 emissions just because they want to expand industries and roads and other uh, things Okay, next, next question number 20. Will the emit data be publicly available for commercial use for a commercial company? And yes, and if yes, how do I access the data? Yes, the data is publicly available. All of NASA data is open source and publicly available. Um, the emit data is available through one of the NASA, what's called as the distributed archive centers, LP, uh, in this case, LPDAC. So I've provided the list there. If you click on that link, you will see a list of different emit datas that are available, and some of them are related to methane and CO2 plumes. Okay, question number 21. Are CMIP-5 emissions of carbon monoxide significant to investigate? Um, I am not an expert on carbon monoxide, and I can... Uh, certainly talk to some of my colleagues who work more in that domain and I can come back and later on provide a response or point to specific papers that um, the person who has a question can then refer to. Wonderful. Question number two, how much CO2 and CH data is available over Nigeria? CH4, I'm assuming. Yes, that's what I assumed. Um, so, with both OCO2 and OCO3, with the regular Nader and Glint data that we collect, there is uh, coverage over Nigeria. So, if you go back to the training in part one and you follow the links from where you can download the data for OCO2 and OCO3, if you download the data and plot over Nigeria, I'm sure you'll see quite a bit of coverage. I will also point out that that region can be pretty cloudy or there can be a lot of interference from dust plumes that happen from the Saharas. And so there are data gaps over that region of the, over that part of the world. But in general, there is data available. Um, the OCO2, OCO3 doesn't see methane. So for methane, you would have to then look at something like Kropomi to look at that data. Now, the OCO3 SAM data specifically, we have SAMs that are taken over Lagos. And so if you go to the, again, download those two, three data and you search for Lagos using some of the tools that Karen and David showed, then you'll be able to get the SAM data. Okay, the next, actually the next two questions are uh, related to the demo. The first one is, is there a way to convert <clears throat> OCO3 and OCO2 data from uh, NetCDF to CSV or TIFF using Python scripts. And uh, perhaps David or Karen would want to jump in. My apologies, I was looking for the mute button or unmute button. Um, I believe I um, answered that for those who can look at what was written. Uh, yes, so the, the short answer is yes, that is possible. Uh, it's a little bit more extensive as work and we have developed actually a script that we put into uh, Python notebook. And um, we have talked about this in the past. 
the, the issue, of course, is that uh, we cannot publish any of our notebooks until it has been cleared. And so uh, I am in the process of working on that to make sure we get the appropriate clearances before I can upload it. So thank you for your patience. We will get this up for folks to use. Um, it, we had some changes where I can't just share a notebook um, because I have presented it in the past or making it available. It has to go through a clearance process. So I will get that taken care of because we have gotten quite a few questions about um, wanting about file, uh, to know about file conversions and, and being able to work with our data that way. So I'll make sure that gets updated. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And actually what we'll do uh, is we'll make a note on the uh, training webpage, the RSA training webpage, um, indicating participants that these updates have been made on the, uh, on the GitHub. That would be helpful. Thanks, Erica. Yeah. Question number 24. How do we set the min max of the color bar? Is it picking the range from the data set or do we define it explicitly? Well, um, if you go in the notebook that's presented, it's specifically in cell 14 in the notes, you can say that um, you can actually pick the range. Obviously, uh, you define the min and max. If there's no data there, you're not going to see anything, but it, it's defined that way. Uh, so it is in the, the notebook. Great. Next question. Number 25, in the presentation, the point was raised about validation of bottom-up estimates using OCO3 SAM observations. How can we do that with differences in spatial resolution and other issues? That's a really, really great question. So thank you for asking that. Um, so the way this is done typically is that you have to bring both sets of estimates to the same spatial and temporal resolution. So let's say the bottom-up estimates are available at one kilometer and daily. You have to aggregate them up to something that's like, let's say 15 kilometers or 20 kilometers and weekly or monthly sets of estimates. And then you can compare that against the OCO3 derived, like the inverse modeling or top-down approach derived estimates that are at those coarser resolutions. There are other types of approaches that, so th this is like a direct comparison and that can help you get a sanity check on the bottom-up emission estimates that you are using. In most cases, people use some different approaches uh, or some different techniques, I should say, where you can look at the time series of emissions from the two different approaches and then see if you see a discrepancy in the trend or if there are particular instances when the estimates are hugely diverging or for particular sectors, they might be very different and that can help bridge the gap between those two estimates. Okay, the next question, it has two parts. The first one has been answered already. Question number 26, if it's possible to export data to GeoTIFF, that was answered in question 23. Uh, let's focus on the second part of this question. Is there data that can be accessed all over the world, OCO3 data? Yes, the OCO3 data, or it Typically, because it's situated on the space station, so it sees between 52 north to 52 south. And between that domain, um, you can pretty much, you get coverage over that entire uh, domain. I believe in part one, we have shown a couple of, of animations or visualizations that show the coverage for both OCO2 and OCO3. So if you look at that, you'll see we have data all over the world. Okay, so the next question, why are there straight lines or slash patches with the same color in cities and data from cities in the hands-on exercise and how do you remove them? Hi, uh, so I, I I know where those show up and that's when we have a year's worth of data. And in that particular exercise, 
we are mapping the available data. We're not creating a snapshot area map. And so um, I wanted to distinguish that, yes, you can plot the data and it shows you what's available and, and that's what we have. If you're looking for something that's cleaner, uh, like what uh, Dr. Chatterjee had presented, you really need to go to the website and look at the snapshot area map for those specific, because that's when the science team members, that's something that they've created. And I would highly recommend going there because um, it's 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 two different ways of looking at. One is an official product, that's what they have for SAMS, and the notebook is an exercise to allow you to quickly get an idea of what the OCO3 data can provide for you for, to look at. But if you want something that is much more um, defined, like, um, that that without the lines and everything, I think you need to go to the SAMS website to get that. Okay, thank you. Question number 28, how do you obtain the background CO2 in an urban area? I'm assuming that they're talking about a value. I wasn't sure what they meant by the background CO2, are they talking about some values, maybe? Yeah, I believe, uh, so in the demo, it was set to a given amount. Um, that's subtracted, can... that, that you subtract, um, we, because it's not an easy process, but for the sake of the exercise, it's just to uh, keep it simple. Uh, we set it the background at 410 parts per million, which is what was reported for Edwards. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the, for, or I think it was Edwards Air Force Base. Um, yeah, the Edwards. That, that's where we have a decon. Yes. And we use that as a reference. But, and, go, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, so, sorry, Karen. I mean, there was a slide in the package. Uh, I believe it was slide 20. To, let me open up um, where we do talk about different ways in which that background is defined. And there are references to papers that have implemented those different techniques. Um, again, I, I know this background question has come up before. There is no a standard or standardized definition of how the background is done. It depends really on researcher and application to application. And it does result in uncertainty in the final emission estimates. Okay, moving on then to question number 21, where can you obtain the geographic boundaries for an urban city such as Los Angeles? Uh, <laughs> that's again a great uh, question. So, for Los Angeles, it's easy to say um, the Los Angeles County, they kind of provide a definition, this raster data sets of what they consider the Los Angeles city. Um, I can search for that link and provide it. Uh, that's the case for a lot of US cities as well, um, or cities within the US and within Europe, uh, where these definitions are already available. You can go pick out a map and use the gridded map to then extract data. It's not the case for everywhere on the globe. Uh, in some cases, if you use a tool like ArcGIS, uh, the city definitions might be available. In some cases, they are not. I, am, I would point out that the city definitions are changing, like the urban areas, and as we have mentioned previously, the overall definition and scope of urban areas and urban boundaries, those are constantly evolving. Um, so it kind of definitely depends upon particular city that someone is interested in, um, whether something is available on GIS or they would have to do based on population maps or like other indicators to kind of get a sense of how the urban area is defined or how the boundary is defined. Okay, thank you. Question 30, are there any sensors or algorithms to evaluate N2O emissions? Uh, there are algorithms to evaluate 
N2O emissions. Uh, so right now the N2O measurements all come from in situ measurements. So which means like different flask sites or other different network of measurements. And then those measurements are used, can be used within the same inverse modeling framework and one can come up with estimates of what NTO emissions are. Um, to the best of my knowledge, and Erica, you might know about this more, the best of my knowledge, I do not know there is any NTO sensor available. I'm or, not aware of either. Yeah, any remote sensing sensor available. Uh, there was discussion, I'm trying to remember the name now. Let me see if I can. Uh, there was discussion of a satellite project that could do it. I think it was called Minos or Minos. Um, and it, it, it is like a mission concept that has been proposed to the European Space Agency. I do not know if uh, that's actually going to be operational or not. Okay, then the last question, and this one again is related to fluorinated gases. Uh, what global monitoring systems are available to track fluorinated gases? And are there any satellite missions that can measure them? I, I again, I'm not an expert on fluorinated gases, so I would have to inquire with some colleagues who are experts in that area and get back to this um, and get back to this question. Okay. So that concludes our Q&A session then. Um, wow, we got through 31 questions. That was great. Uh, so before I close, I would like to thank all of the participants I would like to thank the RSAT team, Selwyn hudson Odoi, Brock Blevins, Natasha Johnson-Griffith, Jonathan O'Brien, Sumanti, Melanie, Cook Foyer. And I would more than anything like to thank our invited lecturers. Um, today, we had a, a great presentation from Dr. Abhichek Chatterjee and from at the demo from Karen Yuan and David Moroni. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Vivian Payne, who presented the first session, and Dr. Junji Liu, who presented the theoretical portion of the second session. Um, before I close, I would like to remind participants that the homework is due on August 14th, and to also please make sure you fill out the survey that we'll be sending out, let us know what you found, uh, what you liked about this training, what you would like to see in future trainings related to CO2 measurements and carbon fluxes. Um, okay, so before I close, I would like to hand the floor over to Dr. Abhichek Chatterjee uh, for his final words. Uh, thank you, Erika, again, for moderating uh, the discussion and Thank you, Karen and David and all of the RSET coordinators. And then a very big thank you to all of the attendees, uh, all of you who were able to attend and learn about some of the data that we are collecting uh, from both OCO2 and both, uh, from both OCO2 and OCO3, and then the different science applications that this data has been used for. Um, all of our contact information is available at both the Q&A and in the different slides. So if as you start working with the data and looking at it and you have any questions then please absolutely feel free to reach out to us but thank you all thank you very much dr chatterjee and as you know the demo was put together by david moroni and karen ewan uh, karen presented it but i would like to uh, give the opportunity to david uh, for any any words that you'd like to say to participants before we close Yes, thank you for this opportunity. And I just want to say uh, the vast majority of the credit goes out to uh, Karen Nguyen uh, for putting that, that demonstration together. Uh, my, my support was more in the testing portions and uh, facilitating with um, uh, the Earth Earth Access Library uh, uh, module and also the environment.yml file that was put together there on the GitHub site. Uh, but yes, thank you again. Looking forward to your feedback. Thank you so much.
Thank you, David. And uh, Karen, any words from you before we close? Thank you very much to everyone for joining us today. Um, we enjoy putting these together because we want you to be able to use the data and we look forward to feedback, papers. Please reach out to us if you have other questions and uh, give us feedback on the survey. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I just want to highlight that yeah, we, the, the OCO team and NASA wants you to use this data. So make sure that if you run into any sort of um, issue trying to uh, access or open the data or interpretation, make sure you reach out to any of the instructors that presented during this training to try to resolve that and facilitate your use of the data. So with that, I would like to uh, close this training. Again, thanks to all of the participants for your enthusiasm 